Whenever you go hiking with asthma, you'll always find a breathtaking view. <laughs> <laughs> and you ever thought what's an appropriate song to play during an asthma exacerbation? Take my breath away. Hello everybody, it's Ryan here. Hope you and your family are well. Today we're going to be talking about asthma. I encourage you to smash that subscribe button if you enjoy the content that's going to follow. This is an outline of our video, right? We're going to be addressing a clinical question regarding asthma. Then we're going to break down asthma in terms of key points in headline form in terms of what you need to know about the condition and how to manage it. Then we're going to delve more into the introduction and talk about the etiology and pathobiology, looking at patient presentation and signs and symptoms and how patients present, looking at a plausible differential diagnosis, how to evaluate from a diagnostic standpoint in terms of investigations, looking at treatment and management modalities, and lastly, prognostication and complication. And then, of course, we're going to end up with scripture from the Bible. Thank you so much for joining me. Let's get stuck in, guys. So today we have a 24-year-old woman who is seen for a complaint of shortness of breath and wheezing. She notes the symptoms to be worse after she has exercised outdoors and is around cats. Meow. She has had allergic rhinitis in the spring and summer for many years and has suffered from eczema as a child. On a physical exam, she is noted to have expiratory wheezing. Her pulmonary function test demonstrated forced expiratory volume in one second, <coughs> excuse me, of 2.67, which is 79% of predicted, a forced vital capacity of 3.81, which is 97% predicted, and an FEV1 to FEC ratio of 70%, which is 86% predicted. After administration of salbutamol, the forced expiratory volume increases to uh, 3, which is 12.4%, right? So it increased by 12.4% after administration of the beta 2 agonist. Now, which of the following statements regarding the patient's disease process is true? Is it A, confirmation of diagnosis requires a methacholine challenge? Is it B, mortality due to the disease has been increasing over the past decade? C, the most common risk factor in persons with the disorder is genetic predisposition. Is it D, the prevalence of the disorder has not changed in the past several decades? Or is it E, the severity of disease does not vary significantly within a given patient with the disease? Hmm, nice to ask, no? So guys, here are the key points. Asthma is a disease of diffuse airway inflammation caused by a variety of triggering stimuli resulting in partially or completely reversible bronchoconstriction, and that's the buzzword, bronchoconstriction, due to swelling, secretion, and spasm in the airway. Symptoms and signs include dyspnea, chest tightness, cough, and wheeze. The diagnosis is based on three pillars, history, physical examination, and pulmonary function testing. Treatment involves controlling triggering factors and drug therapy, most commonly with our beloved inhaled beta 2 agonists and inhaled corticosteroids. Prognosis is very good with treatment. <coughs> Alrighty, so guys, let's talk about the introduction. Asthma is a chronic disorder of the airways characterized by number one, chronic airway inflammation, number two, bronchial hyperactivity, and number three, reversible airway obstruction. And that is how we differentiate asthma from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Both are obstructive pathologies, but asthma is reversible, COPD is irreversible. Airway inflammation leads to symptoms of cough, wheeze, chest tightness, and shortness of breath, particularly at night or in the early morning. Why at night? Because at night, your endogenous levels of cortisol are lowest, which allows inflammation to predominate, especially late at night or in the early morning. <coughs> Asthma is increasing in incidence among kids and adults, despite significant scientific advances in understanding and treatment. Although asthma-related deaths are rare, mortality rates appear to be on the rise. Asthma can be deadly if not treated appropriately. Uh, approximately 5,000 deaths occur annually due to asthma-related complications. Okay, guys? Let's talk a little bit about etiology, epidemiology, and risk factors. So asthma exacerbation begins with bronchospasm and airflow obstruction. This is then followed by invasion of the inflammatory components into the bronchial smooth muscle, which results in three things, guys. Swelling, secretion, and spasm. Three S's. Swelling, secretion, and spasm. Or in other words, airway edema, increased secretions, and mucus plugging. This late inflammatory phase explains why steroids are absolutely essential in our treatment arsenal. Now, acute attacks are commonly triggered by environmental exposures like cats, pollen, 
cold weather, infection, especially the way of upper respiratory tract infections, exercise, anxiety, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or medication non-compliance. The secondary inflammatory reaction begins with mast cell activation and degranulation, which releases our good friends, the pro-inflammatory mediators, histamine, prostaglandins, thromboxin A2, and everybody's favorite, leukotrienes. <coughs> Now, during an acute asthmatic episode, elastic recoil within the bronchiospinal musculature decreases. This change in compliance of the lung further depresses expiratory flow rates and increases your total lung capacity. Prevalence ranges from 5 to 10 percent depending on age and region of the world. Asthma can develop at any age, but half of the cases usually develop during childhood before the age of 10 years old. Okay, this is a nice table from Harrison showing us exposure and risk factors. Um, related to the development of asthma. So, like we said, allergen exposure and those who have a genetic predisposition to atopy, it keeps company with eczema and hay fever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, occupational exposure, air pollution, infections, especially viral and mycoplasma pneumoniae, tobacco, obesity, diet, fungi in allergic airway mycoses, uh, acute irritants and reactive airway dysfunction syndrome, something we call RADS, high-intensity exercise in elite athletes, right? Okay, here we're looking at an illustration of how genetic susceptibility and the development and exposure during the lifespan uh, interact to produce a disease that can vary in intensity and chronicity. Disease expression is characterized by airway hyper-responsiveness with varying degrees of airway inflammation and airway structural changes accompanied by varying degrees of symptoms that can be influenced by exposure to triggers that can cause acute deterioration as well as chronic symptoms, right? So we have here genetic susceptibility and risk genes in atopy together with exposure and risk factors prenatally in childhood or adulthood which together are going to work to give you symptomatic or asymptomatic asthma together with inflammation and structural changes. This gives rise to then increased symptoms or exacerbations upon exposure to triggers like <coughs> and predisposed to recurrent asthma exacerbations, which refers to periods of increased dyspnea, spiritual production, and wheeze, uh, exacerbating the asthma, all right? Beautiful diagram here explaining the pathology of what goes on in the airway of someone who has asthma, right? So here we can see an, on, on the... the, uh, the on the left-hand side of the diagram, a normal airway, and on the right-hand side, we can see, uh, uh, you know, um, an airway affected by asthma, right? So the left-hand side, like we said, represents the normal airway, the right is an asthmatic airway, highlighting the pathological changes that are seen. The asthmatic airway lumen is reduced by smooth muscle constriction, mucus or mucus <laughs> in the airway lumen, and thickening of the submucosa due to edema and cellular infiltrate. In addition, the ability of the lumen to increase in size with smooth muscle relaxation may be impaired by deposition of collagen. Oh dear, so collagen comes and makes the airways stiff. The epithelium is disrupted and there is evidence of vascular and neuronal proliferation. All these changes may not be seen in one individual and certain patients may have normal appearing airways, right? So here we can see vascular proliferation, neuronal proliferation, epithelial denudation and shedding, mucus production, cellular infiltrate, airway edema, invagination of the airway mucosa due to smooth muscle constriction, right? Here we have all the pro-inflammatory mediators which are implicated in the pathophysiological process and we are comparing uh, type 2 inflammation with non-type 2 inflammation, right? Allergens and non-allergenic stimuli can trigger activation of multiple inflammatory cells and the release of mediators that are responsible for recruiting and activating these cells. The mediators can affect airways, wound mass proliferation and hyperresponsiveness and fibroblast proliferation and matrix deposition, right? So among these, we can see uh, transforming growth factor, beta, a whole range of interleukins, GMCSF, which is granulocyte, monocyte, colony stimulating factor, leukotriene, histamine, uh, which involves the mast cell, the eosinophils, etc., which gives rise to contraction, hyperresponsiveness, and smooth muscle proliferation, right? Versus non type 2 inflammation, which is instigated by irritants, polytons, microbes, and viruses, and eventually result in smooth muscle constriction and airway hyperresponsiveness. Alrighty, guys, so how do patients with asthma present? I'm sure all of us know of somebody who is asthmatic, right? It's the classic triad of cough, dyspnea, and wheezing. Remember, wheezing is a rather non-specific sign and may represent cardiac asthma and may happen in the setting of pulmonary edema, second D2, congestive heart failure. So watch out. Not all patients who wheeze actually have asthma. Some of them may have congestive heart failure. 
all right? <coughs> Chest tightness, nocturnal awakenings, lung overinflation with air, mucus, and debris, sleep disturbance, tachycardia or tachypnea during episodes. Beware of asthmatic patients who do not have any breath sounds of a modern examination. Their airways may be so constricted and, and so critically narrowed that no wheeze is actually produced, and that patient is close to being in status asthmaticus. Okay, so severe acute exacerbations are marked by accessory muscle use, inability to speak in full sentences. That is a big harbinger of impending respiratory arrest, okay? Decreasing air movement, hyperinflation. So if you look at the anterior posterior damage of the thorax, it is increased, and that speaks to air trapping, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. Altered mental status, secondary to hypoxemia. Pulses paradoxus, we addressed before, and this is a fall in the systolic blood pressure by at least 10 mils mercury or more during inspiration. Alrighty. A differential diagnosis for asthma includes chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, we addressed this, vocal cord dysfunction, it could be upper airway obstruction in the way of tumor, croup, edema of foreign body, it could be a drug-induced cough, especially secondary to ACE inhibitor. Could be bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, pulmonary embolus, anaphylaxis or allergic reaction, bronchiolitis, upper airway disease in the way of allergic rhinitis. It could also be a vascular ring or a laryngeal web. <coughs> so here we're looking at um, a 2019 update to our local guidelines here in South Africa uh, from an article entitled Approach to Asthma Management in Adults by Shilek et al. Right, so here, if you have symptoms identified that are deemed to be consistent with asthma, right, the preferred option is to go for spirometry before and after an inhaled rapid acting bronchodilator. Okay, and then you measure your force vital capacity, FVC, your force expiratory volume in one second, the FEV1, and you compute your FEV1 to FVC ratio. All right, if the results are normal, you want to consider an alternative diagnosis or consider peak flow monitoring or bronchial hyper responsiveness testing, which is a methicoline resistance or methicoline challenge. Okay. Uh, if, however, the spirometry results are consistent with asthma in that you have FEV over FVC ratio less than 0.7, which is reversible upon administration of a bronchodilator, then you simply administer short-acting beta 2 agonist as needed to relieve symptoms. Start an anti-inflammatory therapy, especially in the, in the way of a, a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. Look for triggers by history and occupation and exposure and consider allergy testing. Consider any relevant comorbidities. Right, you want to then reevaluate the diagnosis, control, and treat at follow up visit. Okay, guys, how do we investigate and work up patients with asthma? So, the usual tenets for medicine is take a good, thorough history and examine. Right, there is no substitute for that. So, a past history of seasonal allergies, nasal polyps, and an onset of wheeze after exposure to physical activity or irritants supports a diagnosis of asthma. There is something we call SAMTAS triad, which is the triad of wheeze nasal polyps, and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug use. And the thinking behind this is that when you give non steroidals it actually uh, inhibits your prostaglandin synthesis, right? But it pushes uh, those prostaglandins more towards forming leukotrienes, which actually exacerbate the asthma. So it's a kind of like a non steroidal exacerbated wheeze, all right? Asthmatic uh, wheezing is widespread, it's high-pitched, and it's musical, and can occur anywhere during the expiratory phase, of the respiratory cycle, and it's variable in pitch and volume. So it's not a monophonic ringtone, it's a polyphonic ringtone. <laughs> Consider environmental and occupational exposures like smoke, wood dust, fluorocarbons, isocyanates as the cause of adult onset asthma. Note very especially, guys, a history of prior intubations and admissions to the ICU, since these patients are at higher risk and should be treated much more aggressively. Pulmonary function testing may show obstruction, often reveals, like we mentioned, a decreased force expiratory volume in one second and a diminished FEV1 to FVC ratio, normally below uh, the order of 0.7. It'll show you an increased total lung capacity and an increased residual volume, right? Then, sometimes, if your, your, your pulmonary function test is equivocal, you want to consider bronchial hyperreactivity with a methacholine challenge test which can be performed if your PFT is unrevealing and you still have a high clinical suspicion that your patient is asthmatic. Peak explicitly flow rate can be used to follow the course and severity of disease. You want to compare to baseline measurements to determine the level of airway compromise. A 50% drop from baseline supports the diagnosis of an acute asthma attack. 
Chest X-ray as well may be normal or may reveal hyperinflation and it also is used to rule out any other concomitant lung diseases. Is this pulmonary edema? Is this bronchiectasis? Is this TB? Is this pneumonia? You know, the X-ray is going to help us. Arterial blood gas reveals respiratory alkalosis in mild cases. However, as the patient begins to become fatigued and tired and breathing becomes such a chore, your pH is going to fall and your PCO2 rises. And this is an ominous sign, everybody, of impending respiratory arrest. There is no time to faff around. You've got to intubate that patient, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. Hypoxemia and metabolic acidosis are harbingers of severe disease due to poor oxygenation and ventilation perfusion mismatch. All right, here we have uh, some flow volume loops uh, from our PFTs. So, of course, what's on the bottom of this graph is inspiration. You breathe in. And on the top with expiration, breathe out. So the characteristic thing of obstructive lung disease on the flow volume loop is that inspiration is unaffected, but we have this classic scooping of the expiratory phase. There's scooping, as you can see, right? Versus the situation in restrictive lung disease, where both the inspiratory loop and the expiratory loop are decreased in volume, but they're decreased proportionately and there is no scooping of the expiratory curve. So here we're comparing head-to-head -head obstructive and restrictive lung diseases and how they appear on pulmonary function testing. So the posted kids, the posted kids for obstructive lung disease is asthma, COPD, and emphysema, right? The posted kids for restrictive lung disease are interstitial lung diseases, sarcoidosis, silicosis, asbestosis. And you find that the false vital capacity is below 80% predicted in both obstructive and restrictive disease. Uh, the FEV1 is also reduced, but your ratio of the FEV1 over FVC is normal in restrictive lung disease, but is usually below 80% or below 70% in obstructive lung disease. <coughs> Notice well that your total lung capacity is usually quite high in obstructive lung disease due to airway trapping, usually above 120% predicted. But in restrictive lung disease, your TLC, not tender loving care, <laughs> total lung capacity is less than 80% predicted. Your residual volume as well is above 120% predicted in obstructive lung disease, but in restrictive is below 80% predicted. Does obstructive lung disease improve with bronchodilator administration? Of course, yes, if it is asthma, COPD and emphysema do not. Restrictive lung disease does not, right? Looking at your DLCO, which is the diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide, it is reduced in emphysema. <coughs> secondary to alveolar destruction, right? In restrictive lung disease, the DLCO is reduced on account of fibrosis, thickening, and resistance. Alrighty. Okay, guys, let's talk about the classification of asthma severity. So the way we the way we certify this is by looking at daytime symptoms. Uh, let's just get my pen in there. So daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, and peak expiratory flow, okay? And we classify it into mild intermittent asthma or chronic persistent asthma. So, uh, and we divide them into different categories. Category 1, category 2, which is mild, category 3, which is moderate, category 4, which is severe. So in terms of daytime symptoms, right, if you have less than 2 per week, if you have less than 1 nighttime symptom per month, and if your peak expiratory flow is above 80%, we say that you have mild intermittent asthma. Right, but if you have three to four daytime symptoms per week, two to four nighttime symptoms per month, with a peak expiratory flow of above eighty percent, we call that chronic persistent but mild chronic persistent asthma. If you have more than four daytime symptoms per week, more than four nighttime symptoms per month, and the peak expiratory flow has now dropped to sixty to eighty percent predicted, we call that moderate chronic persistent asthma. <coughs> And if you have continuous daytime symptoms with frequent nighttime symptoms and the peak expiratory flow, which is now dipping below 60%, we call that severe chronic persistent asthma, right? Okay, guys, let's talk about treatment and management. Okay, we're obviously going to try and avoid all our potential triggers, okay? And uh, this is once again taken from the guidelines, looking at the control-based asthma management cycle, all right? So here, you want to uh, assess the diagnosis, assess symptom control, are very important to assess inhaler technique and adherence and patient preference. If needs be, you want to adjust treatment in terms of the medications you're giving. Talk about non-pharmacological strategies and treat modifiable risk factors like exposure to pollen and pet dander, etc. And you want to review the response in terms of symptoms, exacerbations, side effects, patient satisfaction, and lung function. 
and then you assess again. So it's a perpetual ongoing cycle. Assess, adjust treatment, review response. Assess, adjust treatment, review response, and so on, right? <coughs> the goals of asthma therapy, as per Harrison's guys, is reduction in symptom frequency to less than two times per week, right? And reduction of nighttime awakenings to less than two times per month. Reduction of reliever use to less than two times per week, except before exercise. No more than one exacerbation per year, very important. Right? Optimization of lung function, maintenance of normal daily activity, which will obviously improve the quality of life. Satisfaction with asthma care with minimal or no side effects to treatment. Already. Okay, so looking at the different levels of asthma control, we can call it either controlled, partly controlled, or crazy uncontrolled. If you control, that means you have less than two symptoms per week. Your activities are not limited. There are no nocturnal symptoms or night awakenings. Your need for reliever or rescue treatment is less than two times per week. Your lung function is normal and exacerbations are none. Very, 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 very good. That is what we are aiming for, right? But if you partly controlled, speaking to any measurement present in any week, being more than two daytime symptoms, any limitation of activity, any nocturnal symptoms, need for reliever or rescue therapy more than twice per week, Lung function showing a peak respiratory flow of less than 80% predicted or personal best. Exacerbations more than one per year. That's what we call partly controlled. Uncontrolled asthma means three or more features of partially controlled asthma in any week and at least one exacerbation in any particular week. All right. This is another fun way from midcomic.com illustrating how we're going to grade our severity of asthma. So we said, you know, this is rehash this. It can be intermittent, mild, moderate, or severe. Intermittent speaking to symptoms. Uh, daytime symptoms less than two per week, rescue medication less than two days per week, nighttime symptoms less than twice per month, and your FEV1 is more than 80% predicted and your FEV1 to FEC ratio is normal, right? Versus uh, persistent asthma, which is mild, moderate, and severe. So mild persistent means you got symptoms more than twice, uh, you know, more than two days per week, rescue medications more than two days per week, nighttime symptoms three to four times per month, and the FEV1 is over 80% predicted, but the FEV1 to FEC ratio is normal. Moderate persistent asthma where you get daily symptoms, you need rescue medication daily, nighttime symptoms more than one time per week, which is getting more frequent, FEV1 is above 60%, but less than 80% predicted, and your ratio is reduced, right? Versus continual symptoms, rescue medication several times per day, nighttime symptoms much more frequently, over seven times per week, FEV1 less than 60% predicted, and your ratio is significantly reduced. That speaks to severe persistent asthma, okay? Okay, guys, let's talk about the stepwise approach to the management of asthma and adults. Alrighty. So, <clears throat> if you're dealing with mild intermittent asthma, which is step one, ideally you want to use an inhaled SABA, which is a short-acting beta agonist when needed. You may, for control, consider low-dose inhaled, inhaled corticosteroid and, as needed, <coughs> a short-acting beta-2 agonist for relief, right? Step two is where we add on a regular preventive therapy. So, you're going to add on a preferred controller choice is low dose inhaled corticosteroid. Example, 250 to 500 micrograms of meclomethasone per day. You may want to cons consider leukotriene receptor antagonists, right, and low dose theophylline as well, right? Step three is initial add on therapy. So you go low dose inhaled corticosteroid, but you're upping the dose, right? Now you're going 500 to 1000 microgram meclomethasone per day or a LABA. A LABA is a long acting beta 2 agonist, the likes of Stalmetrol, Formetrol. We know those deals right there, right? Other controlling options is medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroids. Consider low dose inhaled corticosteroid plus a leukotriene receptor antagonist, right? To relieve, of course, we still use as needed short acting beta agonist uh, or low dose inhaled corticosteroid or formatrol. Step four is persistent poor control. Here we talk about medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroid together with a LABA, long acting beta agonist. Other controller options include ipotropium bromide medium to high dose inhaled corticosteroid or a leukotriene receptor antagonist which is montiluclast okay and then step five is the continuous or frequent use of oral steroids you want to consider the addition of ipotropium anti-immunoglobulin e monoclonal antibody which is omalizumab and the anti-IL-5 antibody which is nepolizumab and, and low dose oral corticosteroids here we're looking at differential diagnosis and comorbidities that may make asthma notoriously difficult to control. All right, uh, Differential diagnosis of diseases with overlapping symptoms that can sometimes present with obstructive PFTs. We spoke about heart failure and COPD. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which gives you lower zone-predominant emphysema. 
right? Especially in youngsters, especially in those who don't smoke. You should always have a high index of suspicion that hmm, maybe this patient has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, right? Area obstruction from mass or foreign body, inducible laryngeal dysfunction, the way of vocal cord dysfunction, bronchiolitis or blood strands, bronchiectasis, tracheobronchomalacia. Comorbidities that can make asthma difficult to control includes nasal polyposis, and we spoke about Samson's triad before, together with non steroidal use, chronic rhinosinusitis, obesity, gastroesophageal reflux disease, GERD, inducible laryngeal dysfunction in the way of vocal cord dysfunction, COPD, anxiety, depression, obstructive sleep apnea. Okay, guys, let's talk about an asthma exacerbation, right? and ventilatory failure in asthma. And exacerbation is basically something which causes the asthma to flare, right? You have increased dyspnea, increased sputum production, increased wheeze, with a propensity to hypoxia, hypercarbia, and respiratory arrest, all right? So the usual go-to, guys, for initial management includes your mainstream or your, your mainstream therapy, beta 2 adrenergic agonist. You get the nebs on board, corticosteroids, be it systemic or inhaled, anticholinergic agents, magnesium sulfate, yes, get it on board, aminophilin, systemic catecholamines to get your salbutamol IV line, IV drip in, theophylline, leukotriene antagonist. If the patient is not better, salvage therapies include heliox, ketamine, glucagon, leukotriene inhibitors, nebulized clonidine, nitroglycerin, nebulized calcium channel blockade, nebulized lidocaine, external chest compression. If the patient is not better, you want to consider non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. What are the contraindications to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation? Altered level of consciousness, hemodynamic instability, excessive secretions, patient is uncooperative, and has a high risk of aspiration. If no, you want to start the NIPPV starting at 10 is to 5 and titrate up as needed. If there's no improvement, guys, and if the patient now has an indication for intubation, right? So ideally, you don't want to wait for the PCO2 to climb up. If you do so, it may be too late. As long as the patient is hypoxic and has uh, signs of tachypnea, right, and uh, type 1 respiratory failure, you want to have a very low threshold for intubation and mechanical ventilation, right? Indications for intubation, guys, let's talk about these quickly. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, clinical criteria and lab criteria. So clinical criteria is cardiac arrest, obviously. Right? Respiratory arrest or impending arrest or profound bradypnea. Tachypnea above 40 breaths per minute. Altered sensorium in the way of lethargy or agitation with, with interfering hypoxia. So, you know, that's air hunger, right? Progressive exhaustion and fatigue. A silent chest, we spoke about this. Complicated battle trauma or unresolving acidosis. Lab criteria include severe hypoxemia despite maximal oxygen delivery, which is basically a partial pressure of oxygen of below 60 mols mercury when the patient's on a 100% non-rebreather mask, right? Worsening respiratory acidosis or failure to reverse severe respiratory acidosis despite intensive therapy. Of note, it is not hypercapnia, but respiratory acidosis that triggers the intubation, right? Your blood gas criteria is a pH of below 7.2, a pCO2, an increasing trend or above 65 mols mercury with an abnormal pH. If this is the case, guys, you want to intubate, you might want to start with volume control and ventilation, set a low respiratory rate, Paralyze the patient completely for air trapping and increased pressures, right? Initial ventilator setting for an asthmatic patient is basically controlled mechanical ventilation at about 10 breaths per minute with a tidal volume of 7 to 8 mils per kg ideal body weight, peak inspiratory flow of at least 60 liters per minute constant flow or 80 to 90 liters per minute decelerating flow. Fraction of inspired oxygen initially set at 1. <coughs> Auto peep or plateau pressure should be followed during mechanical ventilation, right? Hypercapnia is preferable to hyperinflation but not in the context of raised ICP, right? Acceptable hypercapnia is a pH as low as 7.15 and a PCO2 upwards of, say, 18 mils mercury. Now, issues with managing an intubated patient with asthma, right? We broadly categorize this three ways. Assessing pulmonary hyperinflation, adjusting ventilator settings based on severity of hyperinflation, and how to manage the hypercapnia, right? So in assessing pulmonary um, hyperinflation, volume of gas exhaled during prolonged apnea uh, is important and is affected by severity of airflow obstruction and vent settings. That is the most reliable predictor of ventilator-related complications. Your plateau airway pressure in acute severe asthma averages 24 to 26 centimeters water. It's acceptable at about 30 centimeters water. Auto peep is 10 to 15 centimeters water in severe asthma during volume cycle ventilation. Peak airway pressure, our target is less than 50 centimeters water. Your peak airway pressure depends on inspiratory flow, resistive properties in addition to hyperinflation. 
Peak pressures of above 50 centimeters water does not predict increased risk of bladder trauma, right? You want to adjust the vent settings based on severity of hyperinflation. So looking at the minute ventilation, you want to increase your minute ventilation. Uh, and when you do so, it increases the risk of hypotension and bladder trauma when increased from 10 to 16 to about 26 liters per minute. You want to have minimal PEEP of less than 5 centimeters water. That's the recommendation. How do you manage hypercapnia? Hypercapnia is a consequence of the dead space right, caused by alveola over distension. Serious consequences of hypercapnia are rather uncommon. Neurologically, it increases cerebral blood flow, increases your, your intracranial pressure, may have the propensity to cause cerebral edema and subarachnoid hemorrhage. In terms of your cardiac, it decreased intracellular pH reduces myocardial contractility, which can predispose to uh, shock. Okay? Consider an alkalizing agent when pH is persistently below 7.157.2 in the way of sodium bicarb. Alrighty. <coughs> so obviously we know medical management of asthma in intubated patient, systemic corticosteroids, inhaled beta to agonists via inline NEBS. You can give salbutamol, albutamol, consider hypertropium, so AB NEBS, active and beta tech NEBS. <clears throat> Other bronchodilators in the way of IV theophylline, consider magnesium sulfate. V very important is to sedate the patient completely, paralyze them completely, right? Uh, for this, we use a combination of propofol and fentanyl. Neuromuscular blocking agents is sometimes necessary, and they have intermittent boluses rather than continuous infusion. Additional measures, although not supported by strong evidence, heliox, which is a mixture of helium and oxygen, inhalational anesthesia in the way of isoflurane, ketamine IV, bronchoscopic removal of impacted mucus, okay, especially when you see a, a, a atelectasis on the chest x-ray, and ECMO as well. Okay, guys, we're winding down now. Prognosis and complications. So asthma, as we know, follows an episodic course with acute exacerbation separated by symptom-free periods. Most patients will respond to therapy, which is aimed at reducing airway inflammation. You want to ensure proper technique and regular administration of controller medications if the patient is not responding to conventional therapy. Complete remission of juvenile asthma can occur, but persistent deficits in your FEV1 are usually detected well into adulthood. Adult onset asthma is less likely to go into remission, but usually does not affect life expectancy unless other comorbidities are also present. Poorly controlled asthma can lead to airway remodeling and loss of lung function. Routine office spirometry should be followed at least annually in asymptomatic patients. Alrighty guys, coming back to our clinical case, I'm sure we can remember this. Just to rehash, we've got a young lady complaining of shortness of breath and wheeze. She has uh, symptoms that are worse when she has exercise outdoors and is around cats. She had allergic rhinitis uh, previously and eczema as a child. Her uh, pulmonary function test is supportive of obstructive airway disease, which is reversible. So it points to asthma, right? Now we ask the question, which of the following statements regarding the patient's disease process is true? The answer is the ding, E. The severity of disease does not vary significantly within a, within a given patient with the disease. So risk factors for fatal asthma include, number one, frequent use of rescue inhalers, number two, lack of therapy with inhaled corticosteroids, number three, prior hospitalizations, especially ICU admissions for asthma. Interestingly, the overall disease severity does not vary significantly within a given patient over the course of the disease. <coughs> okay, my friends, I hope that you allow me to speak a bit from the Bible. The book of Proverbs chapter 8 verse 17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. Jeremiah 29 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. The Lord wants fellowship with us. That is the very reason that God created man. So you can commune with man and have a relationship with him. The Bible says, Draw close to me and I will draw close to you. Seek me and you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I pray that that is how we will seek the Lord, completely and totally with all our hearts. All right, here are my references, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoyed this content, I strongly encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. I really appreciate your friendship on my channel. You can also uh, find me on Facebook. Just search for Internal Medicine Algorithms and Mnemonics. You can also catch me on uh, TikTok. I'm also on Instagram as well. We're going to be talking about the cousin brother of asthma soon, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. I'll see you then. Take care.